Hi, I'm Steve O'Connor with Midwest Panel Builders, and today we're going to talk about antennas, how they work, and important considerations for installation. The antenna is one of the most important pieces of equipment when it comes to RF transmission, yet is often the most neglected part of many installations. There seems to be a lot of confusion and a lack of good information when it comes to antennas, how they operate, and the best practices for mounting them. Many of the devices that make up our avionics systems uses radio waves to transmit and or receive information to and from different ground and space-based equipment, allowing us to communicate and navigate our way around the world. And the antenna is key to sending and receiving those transmissions. We'll use the comm radio to help us explain the basic operation of an antenna. I do want to start by saying that this will be a very simplistic explanation as the radio operation is far more complex but it should be enough to help you understand not only the operation of the antenna, but why mounting it becomes very important. Radio waves are transmitted on a wide range of frequencies, but an aviation comm radio transmits and receives on the airband frequency range of 118 to 136.975 MHz, with spacing of 25 kHz resulting in 760 channels. Europe expands on these channels with 8.33 kHz spacing. An aviation radio is a transceiver, which means it has a transmitter and a receiver. The job of the transmitter is to send communications out into the air to be picked up by other receivers. And of course, the receiver's job is to receive other transmissions. The transmitter works by way of an oscillator that converts DC voltage into an AC sine wave, known as the carrier signal. The carrier signal is what is sent out through the antenna to be picked up by the receiver antenna. The carrier itself has no information, it is just the vessel that carries the information. The information it carries is produced with modulation, either in the form of amplitude modulation, AM radio, or frequency modulation, FM radio. Aviation radios use amplitude modulation to transmit information. So in simple terms, the radio will alter the amplitude of the carrier wave in order to transmit the message. Let's look at how this all works. When the oscillator converts the DC to AC, we get the positive and negative electrons alternating back and forth at a predetermined distance. This is known as a dipole. As the electrons continue to move back and forth, moving to each end of the antenna, it builds up an electromagnetic field that is radiated from the dipole. The speed at which this happens determines the wavelength, which directly correlates to the frequency of the transmitting carrier signal. The wavelength of the signal is double the length of the dipole. Looking at this animation, we can see how an antenna would work. As the AC power is added to the center of the antenna, the electrons flow from one end to the other. The frequency of the antenna is the same as the frequency of the input voltage. The length of the antenna should be half of the wavelength. Since we do not use only one frequency, we need an antenna whose length corresponds to the frequency nearest the center of the range. In our case, we'll be shooting for a frequency of about 127 megahertz. This gives us a wavelength of approximately 92 inches. This means that our dipole will have to be half of that or 46 inches, which that would be quite a long antenna. Fortunately in aviation, we use a monopole antenna, which is one quarter of the wavelength, and in our case, approximately 23 inches. This makes it much more manageable. Since our antenna length is only one quarter of the wavelength, we have to make up the difference for the antenna to work properly. For this, we use a ground plane. For metal aircraft, we can simply use the airframe to accomplish this, but for composite aircraft, we have to build up this ground plane. The alternating voltage travels up the antenna and back down through the ground plane, allowing the electromagnetic field to properly propagate. For this reason, we need to be sure that we have a proper ground plane and that the antenna is properly mounted to this ground plane. You also want to make sure you properly seal the antenna so that moisture doesn't get underneath them, causing corrosion that not only destroys the antenna, but can also affect this ground plane. This video has been all about comm antennas, but the theories are the same for all antennas, especially antennas that transmit like transponders and ELTs. Always be sure to mount antennas per the manufacturer's instructions. Another important factor in the antenna discussion is the transmission line. We use coaxial cable for this purpose and it's very important to not only use the proper coaxial, but make sure that it's properly installed and connected. Modern aircraft installations will typically use RG400. It's a low loss double shielded cable that helps reduce interference. It's very important to be sure that you do not kink the coax. Not only can it affect the impedance of the cable by kinking the insulator around the center conductor, but it can hinder the flow of the signal. 
turn should not be any tighter than the circumference of a pop can. Once installed, we can test the coax and antenna by measuring the standing wave ratio. The standing wave ratio is the reflection of the signal back to the transmitter. The higher the number, the more the reflection. We can use an SWR meter to accomplish this. When we're testing a transmission line, we're looking for an SWR reading of less than 2 to 1. And we accomplish this by using as few connections as possible, making sure our connections are properly terminated, and by using high quality BNC connectors. If you look at the end of this coax that is disconnected, we have an open circuit with infinite resistance. If we were to transmit on this cable, the entire signal would reflect back to the transmitter causing a high reading and would likely damage the circuits inside. For this reason, we never want to transmit a radio without an antenna attached. I'd like to mention a couple considerations when it comes to the GPS antenna. The signals received by the satellites are quite weak, therefore minimizing connections is extremely important as the impedance of the run is critical. There will be a maximum or minimum lengths to the coax cable depending on whether the antenna is passive or active for this very reason. Another important point is to be sure that the GPS antenna is in the open with a clear view of the sky. Airframe shadowing can be an issue. And we have diagnosed several issues related to position errors, especially in ADSB applications, for this very reason. So be aware of these issues and be sure to read the installation instructions prior to settling on the location of your antenna. I hope this discussion helps you understand the importance of a properly installed antenna for the operation of communication and navigational equipment. Most of the issues we see when diagnosing poor reception of a comm or GPS signal most always comes down to the antenna installation and or quality. If you like these videos and you'd like to see more, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell. If you'd like to learn more about how we can help you with your experimental avionics project, visit us online at www.midwestpanels.com or give us a call at 810-356-3855. We're also now offering expanded services to builders who want to be more involved with their avionics projects. Our new web store at shop.midwestpanels.com offers all of Garmin's latest experimental avionics and equipment, in addition to our offerings of diagrams and laser cut panel services. Our new services mean that you can directly be involved with the wiring of your avionics, but you can still rely on our expertise and support so that you can be confident in your installation. We thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.